Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome back to the Market Insights webinar. Thank you so much for joining us in this journey. And we're going to extend this journey for another two weeks beyond this session. So we really appreciate your participation. And each week, each week it grows and grows. And in fact, frankly, also to the questions. And we're going to spend some time going through those a little later on. But our focus for today will be in these 30 minutes is to start off with a bit of a risk mitigation. And then, of course, after we finish this session today, you will get a survey and the opportunity to give us some Q&A or questions and answers for that we'll answer next week on this exact webinar. Let me start off with a little bit of introduction. Actually, before that, before the introduction, let me just quickly highlight the disclaimers. Uh, what we're saying for the disclaimers here is effectively that we're not providing you advice. We're just providing you some insights to the overall marketplace itself. Now, let me do a couple introductions. First, I'll start with Mark Reyes, which is the head of product from BMO Exchange Traded Funds, as well as Patrick Cernesna, Cernesna, sorry, uh, TMA, TMX Educator. And uh, Patrick, how was that session you did last week uh, for the TMX? I heard there's some good attendance for that. Oh yeah, we, uh, we had uh, over 1,800 registrants for the Options Education Day. It went really well. No, thanks for asking. Oh, perfect. Good to hear. And that's on replay too, if somebody wants that, right? Oh yeah, for sure. The, anyone who missed it, uh, the Montreal exchanges uh, made the recording available. So it's a great thing to circle back to if you're still interested in more options education, for sure. Perfect, Patrick. Let me stay with you because one of the things uh, I think people like to get some education around is all around the circuit breakers in the marketplace. Now, in the month of March, we certainly had to trigger a few of these. And I'm not sure everybody fully understands them. There certainly were an outcome of the 2010 uh, flash crash. It's really helped disseminate information during times of extreme volatility. Maybe right. you can walk us through how these work. Well, for sure. And so circuit breakers are where they temporarily halt trading in the stock markets to allow a very fast moving markets for all participants to kind of uh, catch their breath and size up the situation before they re-resume trading. And so there's these periods where they halt markets. Uh, but what is really important for us as Canadians to understand is that uh, actually the circuit breakers we have are actually coordinated with the American markets. And the, the reason that is, is uh, the largest Canadian companies are actually interlisted in the US. And if, uh, if the Canadian market was not halting the same time as the US market is halting, it would create an imbalance where a lot of that flow may go from uh, the US markets up here into Canada and vice versa. So when they're halting markets, they, we coordinate between Canada and the US simultaneously. So it's actually triggered on the S&P 500. And even though it's a Canadian halt, it's still based upon the trigger levels of the U.S. market. And um, and so uh, and by the way, there is only one period where that differs, and that is if there's a holiday. So if there's a holiday, for instance, uh, when we're getting to Memorial Day or something like this, but uh, if the U.S. markets are closed, the circuit uh, then they benchmark against the Canadian market for the triggers. So there are brief periods on those periods where the U.S. markets are closed that we do have the, the circuits switch over to the Canadian market alone. But the way it works is this, you assume if we go through any period where the S&P 500 drops 7% in one day, it has to be all intraday, uh, it triggers a 15 minute halt so long as that, that occurs uh, prior to 3.25 p.m. Uh, if that 7% drop was happening in the final uh, 35 minutes of trading, then it actually just keeps trading through 7%. So they they don't actually halt it. So it has to actually happen in between the 9.30 open and the um, 3.25 p.m. Uh, period. And there, then they halt it for 15 minutes, if it, so long as it's before 325. And so just give everyone a chance to catch their breath, make sure everything is going, and then allow trading to re-resume. Uh, then there's a second trigger at the 13% mark, and that again repeats the same exercise. It's a, it's another 15-minute halt, uh, and or a, if uh, it's after 3.25 p.m., they'll just keep, let it keep trading. So the, in order for the halt to occur, it has to be before 3.25. So it's the same for level one and level two. But level three is is basically a hard trigger, is that if the market, for whatever reason, is down 20% in one day, uh, they just shut everything off for the day. Like, yeah, it's done. 
And, um, and so the, the, and that doesn't mean you can't lose more because in theory, the market the next morning could be gapping considerably lower, but it just gives an, again, an opportunity where there cannot be that much um, a greater loss than 20% in any one day. We've, uh, I've, I haven't seen yet a 20% uh, lockdown on that. We've seen the halts at 7% already happen, but uh, it'll be, it's just good to know where these levels are, right? I think so too. That's why I wanted to kick off the show with this piece of education about the markets and specifically as we've been through some of these halts more recently, the, the first level, but where it actually continues to go and what it means on, a, on a, a, a full list of halts across the board. Thank you very much for that. And what we're going to do now is talk about different ways of risk mitigation in the overall marketplace. Both Patrick and Mark are going to spend some time talking about that. What we want to start off, first of all, is talk a little bit about uh, um, the low volatility aspect we're certainly hearing in the marketplace about maybe asset classes or a way of investing to mitigate risk that way. And let me start off with Mark. Can you give us a little bit of background on what you, you know, basically discovered when you're looking at building out ETFs in low volatility? Sure. Thanks, Kevin. And thanks everyone for joining us again today. You know, if I can tie it back into what we were speaking to before, uh, you know, the circuit breakers relate to trading and, of course, are, are within a day's trading session. Low volatility, then, is a way to invest if you're worried about equity market risk, uh, really for the long term. And what's so interesting about low volatility is this anomaly where, you know, you expect over the long run that the riskier names will give you a higher return. In other words, you're getting paid for that risk that you're taking. But the low volatility anomaly says just the opposite, and it's backed by studies going past the, the last 80, 90 years, is that the lower risk stocks tend to get ignored. And because of that, uh, they actually provide a better risk-adjusted return, and as well, uh, over the long run again, a better uh, absolute return. So quite interesting that less risky stocks typically produce better returns. And the, the other thing that really plays into that is you don't tend to get as much of the downswing with a low volatility name than, than you do with the more you know emerging or growth oriented name. So the big blue at the bottom there, don't think that low volatility uh, necessarily relates to low returns. So, Kevin, Mark, you spoke a bit about the, the upside. You talked about the lower downside of the marketplace. Yeah, you produced this chart for us in advance. I appreciate that. Um, maybe you can speak to what you're seeing in the marketplace, the upside and downside participation by focusing on more of a low volatility approach. Sure. So the upside downside capture ratio just means, you know, when the market is moving up, how much does the ETF move up with it? Or when the market is moving down, how much does the ETF move down with it? And so what you can see is a low volatility approach captures most of the upside, call the average low 80s, but on the downside captures far less than that uh, in the 60s for, for international markets, but in Canada, uh, only around 27%. So that really sticks out. So ZLD represents the Canadian low ball universe. And why is it different in Canada? Just simply because our market is so much more cyclical in nature. So the fact that we're, you know, we're heavily weighted to the banks, we're heavily weighted to even resources through through energy and materials, far more so than, you know, the US or Europe. So when you take a low volatility approach, you're able to take that much more of the market risk off the table. And so to be fair, Mark, there are other choices in the marketplace. BMO, of course, is the first to launch a low volatility in Canada. Thank you for that. But ultimately, maybe we could quickly talk about the other choices in the marketplace so we can be fair all the all the stuff out there. Sure. Uh, there are other products out there, other approaches, just like you would expect, you know, if you looked at different types of active approaches to, to the marketplace. Uh, the the first important consideration is is how they're measuring risk. So we use beta, which is a measurement of market risk, where some other products use standard deviation, which just looks at the volatility of the name itself in isolation. And what you want to think about there is, is what risk are you trying to mitigate? Are you trying to mitigate you know, a broad market downturn? If so, then you're thinking about beta. 
Or if you're more worried about just individual names, then you might lean towards standard deviation. And as well, once you get beyond that, there's different construction methodologies, different weighting methodologies. And I think most importantly, uh, different time frames that people look at uh, in terms of the, the measurement. So as you can imagine, if it's shorter dated, if it's, you know, let's say one year in length, it's going to turn over more often and maybe won't capture longer term risk. But if it's longer term, like our beta measure, which looks at five years, then not only are you going to realize what's going on in the market today and recently, but you're also much more aware of hidden risks uh, that have maybe popped up over the last few years. So the construction methods can differ quite a bit. Uh, thankfully, all have delivered here on the screen uh, lower risk than the, than the broad market. Uh, certainly, if you look at the one year uh, significant gains or less losses, I suppose, than the TSX up to the end of March. And then you can look to the longer side to see, you know, if they're capturing the upside and you and you see that as well with significantly uh, lower uh, risk levels. Thanks, Kevin. So, Mark, keeping with this, you know, let's talk about implementation a little bit here too, because effectively you can start with that strategy of, you know, mitigating your downside, but how would you put that in implementation around a portfolio itself? Yeah, and people will have different views on this. It can be a replacement strategy because low vol, you know, outperforms across a market cycle and and adjusts the the risk profile of a equity investment. So you could you could replace a market cap exposure with it or a basket of stocks. Or, uh, you know, if you're someone who's out there that that picks names and maybe grabs a few higher risk, higher growth names, it's a great complement to that. Uh, and can be used as a core satellite or, or pairing approach. And then beyond that, you can think about it across markets. So, you know, I mentioned that Canada is a little more uh, cyclical in nature. Maybe within your portfolio, it makes the most sense there, and you consider other things in, in other regions. So lots of different ways that you can approach it. A lot, of course, is going to depend on what you hold in your portfolio now. Uh, but it's an easy way to really adjust the risk profile of your of your equity exposures. Thanks. Well, thank, thanks for that insight there, Mark. And I'm going to probably turn to Patrick now, because another thing you can do in the marketplace is beyond shifting the way you invest, maybe actually take a look at getting some insurance in how you invest. And of course, Patrick, with your expertise in, in options, maybe you can talk to us about what puts are and how they work in the marketplace and then give us some examples, too, for that matter. For sure. And, and there's a, a lot of um, ETFs out there that do either uh, option overwriting through cover call writing, or they'll turn around and they will be uh, selling puts as an income generation process. And that's a typical uh, product within there. But uh, what we want to talk about is particularly the buying of the put option. And so to, to kind of step back and reflect what a put option is, it's a contractual obligation between two counterparties to, for the buyer of the put having a guaranteed right to sell at a specific price over a specific period of time on a security. And we'll do an example in just a moment. Now, if someone has the right to sell, the counterparty undertakes the obligation to have to buy it at that specific price or specific period of time. For this, the buyer pays a premium and the seller receives the premium as income. And so there's a lot of uh, um, uh, strategies associated with the premium harvesting or income generation. And the way, best analogy I could think of it is like insurance on your car. You pay premium uh, and you're, most people don't like the idea of buying car insurance and paying for it. But when they crash their car, they're happy they had it. And uh, it's a same, similar type of scenario where uh, where in in the markets, often uh, the seller of the put is like an insurance company who is collecting premium on an ongoing basis for undertaking an obligation, while the buyer has this inherent right to be able to exercise. So, Kev, when we move to the next example, we'll just actually build a, a real example for this. Uh, we uh, so that we have a scenario where an investor owns a stock. In this case, I'm going to be using that uh, that BMO. Uh, equal weight banks uh, ETF, the the ZEB for this example. So our, our investor is going to own the physical shares and now it wants to use an option, uh, some downside insurance. So let's say they're very nervous about the markets. They don't want to sell their stock 
and, um, and, and they want to buy some insurance just to define their worst case scenario. And so uh, the, the maximum risk one can incur, therefore, is the, uh, the, uh, the strike price plus premium paid, which is you've guaranteed a certain sale price. So what is the risk to the strike price? And then what did I pay for the option? And that actually caps your absolute worst loss. And, uh, and so let's actually show this. By the way, uh, yeah, I can't, if you can move on, the key thing that we, is not shown on this slide is while we own the shares of this ZEB, we are actually at the same time continuing to receive its regular dividend stream. And so uh, that is actually something that is discounted into the option pricing. I simply haven't uh, illustrated it all in this chart, but it's worth noting that you continue to receive your dividend income stream while you're doing this. And, um, and so in this example, just to keep the numbers simple, we're going to just say 100 shares of ZEB and investor. The goal is to remove the risk of loss beyond a 10% loss over the next three months. Let's say someone is very worried that the stock market may turn down and they just want to say, look, more, I'm going to be buy and holding the ZEB for a very long time, just really worried right now for the next three months. And I'm willing to pay a little bit of this insurance to um, know what my maximum loss could be. And so uh, at the time when I did this the other day, it was $23 a share. It's uh, actually in, in, the, in the 24 hours that I went from there, we're now almost at $22 and just shows you how volatile the markets can be. But yesterday when I was doing this, a July uh, expiration uh, $22 put, so uh, it was trading at $1.30 a share. And so what that means is that when someone bought this put, even though the shares are trading at 23, they have a contractual, uh, like an insurance policy, a contractual right to be able to sell it anytime between now and July at $22 if they wanted to. Uh, and that means if it dropped to $21 or $20 because we had some uh, volatility and some liquidity event similar to March and it started to go down, this investor is actually guaranteed no matter what to be able to sell at $22. This kit wasn't for free. It's not like a stop loss order. The $1.30 was a premium paid, which the seller received as income for and taking the counterparty risk. Uh, and for that. So when we take the $130 or $1.30 per share uh, it paid, plus if the stock's at $23, the insurance policy, think of it like a deductible on your car insurance, doesn't kick in till 22. And so, uh, so we have a dollar risk between 23 down to 22, but all risk below 22 has been removed. So in total, the maximum risk we could under, uh, or loss we could incur is being down $230. And so we've created at a cost, like uh, through buying this insurance, capping the maximum risk we undertake in this window. Now, this sounds really good, but you wanna recognize that over the very long term, continuously buying insurance can become very costly and tax your long-term returns. But on, uh, if there are these high risk periods where you are very uncomfortable with your positions or you, or you feel you are way too overweight the market, you can always tactically add some insurance on some of the more volatile things in your portfolio that you want to help mitigate some of that volatility by buying that insurance. And so, Kev, if we move on to the next slide, I want to just really point out the key thing. This is an American style option. And while most uh, traders will hold until it's expiry, there is actually the right built within that option at any moment that the put buyer can exercise the put option, give the uh, broker instruction to exercise, which is to physically send the shares to the, uh, to the put seller at the assigned price. Or the, uh, or the strike price that was determined. Uh, this is done through the clearing corporation and it settles overnight. But, uh, but what's always interesting is to just uh, recognize that this is not just some contract that's floating. There's an inherent right to actually deliver the shares and you can deliver the shares. And so it's, a, it's something that is a valuable uh, uh, thing to just understand as that's at your disposal. And that's always the most appropriate all the time, but there are always tactical times where adding put protection may be beneficial. 
Well, thanks for that, Patrick. And also, Mark, too, because it's really kind of important to understand the different ways you can mitigate risks in the marketplace, either changing your asset mix up with a, with a low volatility approach or effectively you know, buying some insurance in the marketplace. Let's dive into some of the questions that came in the last week. And first and foremost, I'm going to move to you, Mark, on this one. And I'm not going to go through the whole question and read it out, but essentially what they're looking for is, are there tools out there that can help you sleuth through the whole entire marketplace and identify ETFs with certain exposure to them, or more specifically, a certain uh, sector or marketplace itself? Maybe, Mark, you can walk us through that. Sure, Kevin. Thanks for the question. Yeah, it's certainly become more challenging as the number of ETFs out there has is, is really ballooned out over the last few years. Um, but thankfully, there are some tools that can help you cut through all, all this noise and activity to really identify what you're looking for. So on our website, bmoetfs.com, we do have an ETF screener up there where you can do something as simple uh, is screen for a certain name. So in this example that we've got up here, Amazon, since someone's asking about FANG stocks, and you can either pull up all the ETFs that happen to hold this particular name, or you can even play with, let's say the minimum weight, pull that up to let's say 5% and really identify the ETFs that have a, an outsized weight in Amazon. And to just, answer the question without really getting deeper into the tool without without too much more detail uh, if you're if you're looking for something that that's going to complement uh, maybe some more Canadian exposures some bank exposures uh, and you're looking to the US just know that the s p 500 it's it's about 25 percent technology and in the, in the top holdings are you know Microsoft Apple Amazon Facebook Google so pretty much hitting across the fangs outside for Microsoft. Uh, so just by buying the S&P 500, like our ZSP, you get a significant weighting to technology. But if you want to take that further, two interesting options would be, one, the NASDAQ, which of course is the 100 largest issuers, um, market caps on the NASDAQ exchange outside of financials. And that's actually got a 50% weight to tech uh, with most of the same names that I mentioned before. Or for a different angle, you could go after something uh, with a quality exposure like our ZUQ, where again, it's close to 50% tech, but it's bringing in a few different tech-oriented names like Intel, MasterCard, um, to complement some of that FANG growth. So there are easy ways to play it. So think the S&P 500, think the NASDAQ, uh, but using tools like our screener on our BMOETFs.com, uh, is a great way to look at uh, single name exposure if you want to do that. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks for that, Mark. And I'm going to stay with you for another question because we had a question coming in on our, you know, asset allocation ETFs. And what I really want to dial into this uh, this question is, you know, what are some of the key values, uh, value adds that come from these new asset allocation ETFs? And of course, you know, the the question mentions ZBEL, there's VBEL, there's XBEL out there too. But I think one of the key value adds of the asset allocation ETFs is there are basket ETFs that rebalance on over a period of time. Mark, can you talk to us about the value add of rebalancing with inside these structures? Sure, Kevin. I think when you think of these ETFs, they're a great tool for someone who invests on their own. Uh, you know, if you typically are out there picking names and maybe building um, some risks in the portfolio that maybe you're not thinking about. Uh, these balanced ETFs really do two things for you. One, they add discipline to the portfolio, and two, they add market diversification. But to answer the question, do they add value through the rebalancing? Absolutely. So we pulled some return numbers that show either no rebalancing or rebalancing. You're generally seeing, and this is across almost a 20-year period, about a 1% uh, return difference per year just coming from that rebalancing because what is rebalancing doing selling high buying low bringing discipline to the portfolio and that directly to this example i think if you would look at some advisor case studies uh more generally speaking they'll they'll feel confident saying somewhere between you know 35 to 50 basis points a year just from rebalancing alone so realize that adding that 
level of discipline to your portfolio really will pay off over the long run. Thanks. Not bad, considering the cost of these structures tends to be the, from the low of the 18 basis points to 22 basis points. So that's a, that's a nice value add pickup across the board. Thanks for highlighting that. And staying with you a little bit more, because I know you have a strong background in uh, fixed income too, Mark. I certainly can probably help us this, because what effectively you're looking at is, you know, in the fixed income market now, should a portfolio kind of more focus towards more higher quality debt instruments? What's your thoughts in around that? Sure. Well, there's really two answers. One is the long-term strategic view of portfolio building. The second being, you know, tactical is their opportunity in the marketplace. So what, what is the purpose of fixed income in your portfolio? One, it's safety. It's to offset um, equity market risk. And two, historically, it's been for income. Now, of course, the challenge is in these days, in these markets, you're not getting a lot of income from fixed income. So it's still the safety element that I think matters more than anything. And the more you're concerned about equity risk, the more you want your fixed income to be more defensive in nature. So there's two things to think about. One is duration, which just simply means how long the bonds have to maturity adjusted for, for any coupon payments. And the second is how risky is the issuer? So quality. So are you gonna go to credit or are you gonna go to government? So right now, uh, a lot of investors are moving to a higher weight in government issues. Um, and because of some of the things going on with the Fed and the BOC, uh, concentrating in one to 10 year bonds. So that's typically what we're seeing from the street right now, going to a higher quality to really offset some of that equity market risk when we, when we see higher volatility uh, in markets really moving around to ensure that from a portfolio construction level, you're getting that element of safety to offset the equity risk. Thanks. And then Mark, actually that kind of relates to the next question that actually came in was around portfolio construction itself. You know, there's a lot of instruments and fixed income you can use and specifically the fixed income aspect of a portfolio. You know, what's, I know you've done a lot of work in this in the past and helping design portfolios around fixed income. What are some of the ways to build portfolios specific around fixed income? And I'll save the second question for free shares as the second part of that. Sure. Well, if you're if you're looking for guaranteed investments, of course, GICs are more the way to go, because uh, then you've got you know no capital at risk. An ETF, even a fixed income ETF, does have a moving nav, so you're subject to to price returns. Uh, so that's your first important consideration. But this somewhat ties into the last question. You 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 do want to be thinking defensively in fixed income, but I didn't spend as much time in the last question on, you know, the tactical side. And you know, we saw a big sell-off in markets. That meant that corporate bond ETFs and more riskier ETFs sold off more. There was an opportunity there at that time to buy those uh, and get a little bit of an outsized return. So, you know, depending on your view, forward view on markets and what markets have been doing, uh, there is an opportunity to, to spread that out. And ETFs are a great way to invest in fixed income. Why? Because they take bonds, which of course are hard to trade, OTC, hard to price, and they put them in an exchange traded package that gives you price transparency, low cost, diversification, and just a single ticket entry point uh, into an asset class that is otherwise you know, more difficult to trade. Uh, so using a few ETFs, like our aggregate bonds, ZAG, or some of the component pieces, depending on your view of markets, uh, using ETFs is a great way to set up a fixed income portfolio. Thanks, Kevin. And the follow-up to that, where do you put preferred shares in that category, in the fixed income or the equity side? What do you think? Yeah, preferred shares are interesting. They kind of straddle the fence between equity and fixed income. Uh, they certainly hold more risk than traditional fixed income. So when markets correct, they tend to drop more than bonds. Uh, but at the same time, because of the higher yield, you know, some people like to use them as a partial allocation in fixed income. Uh, just, just always make sure you don't overdo it. Uh, as a fixed income satellite, fine, tactically fine, uh, but it shouldn't be an outsized part of your fixed income allocation because you're not gonna get that same level of safety. Uh, as you as you do from bonds, so just realize the higher risk, which of course you get to offset with with the higher yield, 
and the fact that it's taxed as dividends, uh, so it's more tax efficient. But it, it's almost a hybrid, almost uh, a bit of an alternative, sort of sitting outside the equity fixed income spectrum. Thanks. Thanks for your perspective on that, Mark. Always appreciate it. I've got time for one more question. I'm going to turn to Patrick. You know, the question really is talking about there's been a big drop, or we're going to retest the bottoms. But I think, you know what, we kickstarted this series with your perspective on and using options to get some insights about, you know, the potentials for up, the potential for down. Maybe you can walk us through that, Patrick, and give us your uh, more of an update towards the broad market. Then maybe even, I think you started off with ZEB yeah. too. So. Let's start with the broad market. Sure, uh, start with the broad market. The, the key thing to take away is this is not a forecasting tool. It's not actually telling you what will happen. It's a it's more of a window of just understanding what the current market is pricing in. So what is the uh, the uh, the options uh, the structure of options and and the way the curves are and everything? What is the options market right now pricing the probabilities out to December? for the market to be in the money on any of these types of strikes. And so what you can observe here on the Canadian TSX, uh, I marked the $25 level, which is sort of the midpoint of the average price of uh, the second half of 2019. And just, you know, the, to a lot of people, that would be a very uh, natural break-even price for what they've seen their portfolios at from a broader Canadian equity perspective. And right now, uh, at least before this, uh, the, today's little drop in the market, the options market was pricing about a 28% probability um, by year's end for, for that level to be achieved. At the same time, for a double bottom retest of the previous low, they were putting about a 17% probability on that. And so if we go to the ZEB here, just to look at the same metrics, uh, for the ZEB to go up to about the $27 level, they're looking at somewhere near around 30% probability, 29%, and the chances of the ZEB retesting those lows was about 19%. So it, it, what's happened, volatility narrowed. That means the the tails, uh, the probability on the tails kind of narrowed a little bit. It was much bigger when we looked at it when we were looking at much higher vol conditions at the time, but uh, it's uh, still, uh, you can see a little bit of a skew still in terms of the upside, but uh, we'll see how this plays out. Thank you for that, Patrick. And of course, if people want some education on the options, maybe you can quickly highlight that too. Yeah, for sure. Anyone who wants to learn more about these options, like we had that options education day, I think the recording can still be accessed. Uh, it's completely free, but there's so many amazing resources out there at the Montreal Exchange. So visit, visit the uh, m-x.ca uh, and there's an education tab with all sorts of amazing resources, including uh, great manuals on options, uh, just great places to get education. Perfect. Thank you for that. And I want to thank everybody one more time for joining us again. We'll be back here next week again one more time at 1 o'clock. And we'll look forward to getting your questions so we can answer them again next time. And to give us your questions, all you have to simply do is take a look at the survey that will come out at the end of this, probably deliver tomorrow. And then effectively you can have a chance to email us your thoughts. And we look forward to respond to them next week. Thanks again. Have yourself a good weekend. Cheers.